Turing 6502. We're at the business end now with the Bring Up. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. Previously, we've built our Turing machine, which essentially consists of a rule book and a notepad, plus a way to keep track of the current rule and where we are on the notepad. And in the last build, we connected up an Arduino Nano to interface to a PC. Now, I've already corrected two errors in the build. This was the first one, the wiring of the 74HC174. In my mind, the 74HC174 was just a short version of the 74HC273 with the bottom two flip flops missing. However, during the build, I found this slight difference between the lower flip flops. The other major error in the build had to do with the output enable on one of the memory chips, and unfortunately, I didn't record myself fixing this. At the start of Bring Up, we need to establish a connection between the Arduino and the PC. We start with our setup routine and loop routine provided by the Arduino IDE. And at first, we just want to make sure that it compiles and can download to the chip. Good. Now we want to establish a serial connection with the PC. I'll start out at 9600 board and just send the ASCII for an incrementing counter down the line. Ah, and don't forget to use serial.println, which forces a carriage return. Now let's add in a delay and increase the serial rate up to 1 million bits per second. So far, so good. I'm going to add in some comments about the port connections. This really just helps with writing the actual code. I'm going to use D2, D3 and D4 to control the interface chips. OK, let's stop it there and look at the architecture again. I want to go over the 74HC245 octal bus transceiver in more detail. This chip allows 8-bit data to travel in either direction, but only one direction at a time. So data can either go from the A side of the chip to the B side of the chip, or the B side of the chip to the A side of the chip. And the first thing to notice is this enable signal on pin 19. When this signal is held at 5 volts, the chip's essentially disconnected from the circuit. But when enable's held low, and pin 1 the direction pin's held high, then data can travel from the A side of the chip to the B side of the chip. Conversely, when the enable's held low, and the direction signal's held low, then data travels from B to A. I've connected the enable signal up to pin D3 on the Arduino Nano, and I've connected the direction signal up to pin D2. The A side of the chip is connected to the data bus on the memory chips, and the B side of the chip is connected to 8 pins on the Arduino Nano. And the other chip type I've introduced into the design is this 74HC257, which is a quad 2 input multiplexer. So the problem is I have a 16-bit address bus, but I really don't have enough pins on the Arduino Nano to read all of these at once. So what I want to do is convert this 16-bit bus down to an 8-bit bus. And then I'm going to connect these 8 pins up to the same 8 pins that the 74HC245 uses. Pin 15 of the 74HC257 is output enable. So when that's connected to 5 volts, the chip's essentially disconnected from the circuit. And this I've connected to Arduino pin D4. And there's a select pin, which is pin 1, which defines whether the upper or the lower connection of a pair is connected to the output. I've connected this select pin up to Arduino pin D2 which is the same pin I've used for direction of the 245. The reason being that we're never allowed to use the 74HC245 and the 257s at the same time, so we may as well use the same pin to control direction. This is how I've connected the 74HC257s in this circuit. When selects at 0 volts, the upper byte of the memory address is selected to go through to the Arduino, but when select is held high, the lower byte of the memory address is selected to go through to the Arduino. Back to the definitions. Now for clock raw, M read, M write, and reset bar. And the eight signals from the 245 and the 257s. Ideally, I would have liked to have used A0 through A7, which were available on the Arduino Nano, except A6 and A7 don't work for digital input, which was kind of annoying. Now I want to set the data direction registers and the output ports to be their initial values. I'll just add in the actual port numbers into the documentation. When I don't do this, I'm forever looking up the Arduino pinout datasheet. 
Most of the pins on the Arduino can be set to be an input or an output, and this is controlled by the data direction register for the port that that pin's part of. Setting the bit to 1 makes the corresponding pin an output. I'll just move this to set up. And I'll just write a quick comment about how direction works. And now for the reset signal. I usually put in a 10 millisecond delay, which is ultimately probably too much. But, you know, I really want it to reset. Now I'm going to see if I can get lucky here. I'm going to raise the clock on the entry to loop, and then read the address bus, the data bus, and print them out the serial port. And just see if it works. Writing 28 to port D enables the 257s, and selects the upper bits of the address range. Now I should be able to read them directly off port B and port C. Writing 2C into port D lets me read the lower 8 bits. And finally, writing 3-4 lets me read the data bus. Now I'll package it up into a human readable form, and I'll send it to the PC via the USB port. And don't forget to lower clock before exiting. Fix those quickly. I'm only getting numbers between 0 and 3 for the lower byte of the address bus, so it means that only bits 0 and 1 are working. Let me have a look at the board and see what the signals are doing. I'm going to add in a delay of 100 milliseconds and see what's happening at the pins. Now I know the first part of the code just sequentially steps through the memory, so each subsequent address pin should be clocking at half the rate of the one before it. And yes, that does appear to be happening. Alright, so now let's isolate out the lower bits of the address bus. Well, that seems to work. Let's try it a little faster. Yep, still good. But when I enable the upper address pins, I get the same problem occurring in the lower pins again. I read the upper pins before I read the lower pins, so maybe it's a timing issue. I know that even an Arduino Nano might switch faster than the breadboard wiring can handle, so now I'll try a 10 iteration for loop around the enable edge transitions. Ah, that's got it. The address is working. Now let's see if we can get data to work as well. Seems to be FF all the time. That's the issue. I'm ORing values together, so I need to clear it. And now data's working too. Alright, now we're getting close. I'm going to isolate out the memory accesses between 2000 and 3FFF and see if it looks like pixel data. Nothing. Initially it copies ROM to RAM, so this delay might be the problem. Ah, that's better. First we have the frame buffer copy, then we have these little segments that look like regional updates. And now I'm going to use the same transfer protocol I used in the Apple II wire by wire build. And you'll remember that after about 20,000 clocks, I needed to send an update display signal, which is a write to CFFF. Let's fire up the C compiler and see what we get. Well, it looks a bit Pac Man ish, but it's still not correct. I tried a few things to no avail, so I thought I'd go back and have a look at the data again. Hmm, well I noticed there are two adjacent entries for each address. Ah, that's what I think's going on. Only one of each pair is actually a valid write. So let me make sure M write is high when I send the data. I've corrected that. Now let's give it a whirl. See if it works. Woohoo, and there we have it. Because I'm starting the compiler after the breadboard, I'm not getting the maze, but this is a major breakthrough. So now I'll see what tricks I can do to speed it up. 
First, we only need to read the lower address bus and the data bus if we're sure we've got a write in the right region. Actually, that worked better than I thought it would. And I'll shorten the for loops around the clocks of the enables down to three. Better again. Now I'll get rid of the for loop and just write the value a couple of times. I don't think that really made much difference. One last trick in the book. I'll clock the circuit 20,000 times per quarter loop rather than just once. Let's see how this goes. And here we have the actual prototype running. This runs at about an eighth real time but I think it's about as far as I'm going to try and push it on this breadboard. It's hard to be precise with the clock, but I estimate it's running at about 300 kilohertz. Let's see how we did against our stated goals. It is a breadboard build, and it is very simple. In fact, if you take away the interface logic and the main memory for the Apple, then the whole 6502 is implemented with just 12 chips. And it's just 7400 series logic, a large SRAM, and two extremely large EEPROMs. Although size is relative and they'd be pretty small by today's standards. I use the Nano instead of the Dewey for display. And yes, it does run Apple II Pac-Man. So let me play it at eight times speed. And in the next video, I'm going to convert this into a printed circuit board with a dedicated clock and display circuit. So don't forget, like, subscribe, and share.